Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to wherever you are in the world. Uh, when I was um, putting together this year's Zoom presentations, I was looking for something a little bit more unusual from some countries we don't see very often. Um, and for somebody who had some personal experience in these unusual countries. And we've picked on one of these this afternoon, um, Romania, and it's gonna be very interesting. And I, I know having seen some of the uh, material in <clears throat> as we've been preparing for it, and I'm looking forward to, to this very much, as I hope you are. So um, if I could introduce uh, Gordon Hardy, please. Um, for him to start to share his screen and do his presentation, please. Well, thank you for asking me, Mike. It's uh, a great honour to uh, give this presentation. And uh, it's not without a little trepidation at seeing some of the people attending today, but um, we have to make a start. So I will run through briefly a little bit about the history of Romania. Here's a map of the area just to remind people the small part of Romania that we're actually looking at today and that is um, the area of Moldavia and Wallachia and uh, that's the areas marked in blue and red on the map because most of this area although I've called it Romania it uh, didn't become Romania until slightly later than well within the period that we're looking at, but it's the two principalities that I'm looking at. It's a little closer. If you look at the blue section of Moldavia there, and you can see the, the wording of it, it does actually cross over into the white bit to the east, and that's because that was previous Moldavia, and um, it was uh, released to um, Russia and uh, in about 1812. So I've largely not included that, although um, much of it is with all of it is within the, the general area there. Also, at this stage of this map, which is 1851, the Danube was not in the two principalities that was actually controlled by Russia at that time but it did soon afterwards go into it so uh, so that's that's the broad picture. Turkey is the main influence because virtually everything south of the Danube and the Danube runs just south of Wallachia there and across the map um, was part of the Turkish uh, empire and if you look at this old map these old maps it often says Turkey in Europe. The two principalities of Wallachia and uh, Moldavia were also part of the Tur Turkish empire but they had an element of free freedom in that they had there were principalities and they had their own prince. Um, I say their own prince they each state had its separate prince but they were appointed by the port who was the head of the Ottoman Empire. Um, but they could fluctuate. Sometimes there were the Prince of Moldavia and other times the Prince of Wallachia. And there were, most of them from about eight, uh, 1720s onwards were um, Greek and they had virtually all worked in, in, the, in Constantinople and they worked closely with the port. So, he had trust in them that they would do as they were as he wanted them. The rules of the game were that the Moldavian and Wallachian state uh, principalities had to provide a sum of money to uh, the Ottomans, and um, this this. It didn't have to be money, it could be goods, and this was raised by taxes. And it was called a tribute, um, which sounds a very benign way of saying taxes. 
Um, it was a tribute to the port. So that's, that's more or less the brief history. I'm going to look at the mail routes through Romania and uh, the reasons for the route, political and financial issues and uh, disease and some simple, um, some simply weather issues, such as whether they can make the route in winter or in summer. Um, courier and foreign mail, how these developed, and uh, then show some route from Great Britain, because really my collection of Romania, when I first started collecting it, I struggled to find good postal history. And I managed to start to find a few items to or from Great Britain. And so I, I expanded that area. And so that's really where the, my study of the routes started. And then uh, a set, brief section on the routes to and from European countries. I'll probably concentrate on some of the unusual routes, but I'll run through the, the, the standard ones. I haven't, although I have shown mail passing through, I haven't looked in great detail at the local routes um, within the country, but they did exist connecting up the various towns. And I will briefly mention this. So development, route changes, etc. The first item I have to show is this letter of 1886, and it's written from the Austrian court, and it's written to the Prince Regent in Yash, um, His Highness, Mr. The Prince Mario Cordato, who was the um, Prince of Moldavia at the time. He actually finished his tenureship at about the time that this letter would have arrived. So I don't know if there was ever a, a reply to it, but basically the letter was saying, would you come into an alliance with us? Um, because the Austrians had a big influence in the area, particularly to the West, and the Russians had a, a big interest in the area from the East, and uh, Moldavia particularly was stuck in between the two, and uh, Russia had um, occupied them on uh, a couple of occasions, and um, Austria were wanting, I think, to produce a, a stronger alliance. They also, of course, existed as a buffer zone, no, both states did. This is a statue of the man who uh, sent the letter, and um, he was Wenz Anton Prince of Kanitz and Reitsburg. Um, and he is pictured here on Marie Therese's statue in Vienna, which is a massive statue. Where, and uh, he is one of the important people on the statue. So we can actually see the man who wrote it. The Austrians were the first people to start to set up posts between um, Constantinople into Europe. And these posts were started, the first ones between about 1720, which went straight in more or less a straight line, northwest up to Vienna. This is a letter that's a little later than that, but it shows the route from, um, Constantinople into Bucharest. This route was originally set up in about 1791 because at the time there was some warring, well, disputes and warring going on in Serbia. And this, the Austrians actually withdrew from Serbia and so decided to um, send the mail to, via Bucharest and to Romania. And this letter, the route here is going up to Trieste and uh, it's a disinfected letter. It would have gone to Rotherham Turn uh, disinfecting station. And uh, this is just the, an example of the disinfectant ring that went all the way around the area, separating Turkey and Europe with uh, Europe itself. And in fact, the line really ran along the, the Danube in the area of Romania and uh, Hungary, um, although rather in terms just inside Romania at Bucharest. This is a disinfected letter. I showed this because when I did the rehearsal, I was questioned, what is a rastal mark? And this is a classic rastal mark that's extremely clear. So that's why I put this letter. 
And Astal is a device that you can see at the bottom of the page, and they look like some sort of medieval torture instrument. And uh, they're basic perforated holes in letters. So when in the disinfecting stations, they could then put the letters into ovens that had fumes in them. Vinegar and various chemicals were used to fumigate these things. And um, they, so they punctured these holes in them. This is a letter actually from the vice consul in Bucharest. And this appears to have come via the diplomatic bag. And it also appears that it was not punched by a vastal as such, it was punched individual holes through it, because some of them go through from the front of as we see it, and some go through from the back. And also they avoided the seal on it, so they didn't break the seal. I don't know if it would have been disinfected as such, but it may simply have been quarantined for a period of time because it did take an extraordinary length of time to get to London, about, about four days. But to me, the most interesting part of this letter is that it is, well, there are two interests. One, it was posted in Lombard Street in, in London and went to Lombard Street where the main office was. And um, they didn't know where the, the place called Rileg was. And so it went to the dead letter office and they came up with it. It was at Moniac in uh, Inverness in Scotland. And that's where it went to. Um, so it, it's got a couple of, but the contents, it talks about the issues in Romania. I cannot but think the Ottoman Empire is fast crumbling and I much doubt whether any sanctions can prop it up. And are our four million Wallachians to be made over to the parental care of a government they detest? Not the hope they have to cling to will be that the creation of a separate kingdom or duchy out of the two principles will unite under a... That happened, to, they did unite 20 years later. Another letter to Rotherham Turn, this time from Vralia, which is on the Danube, one of the big ports. Galatz and Vralia were the main ports, um, and that's where most of the mail that has survived attended to be going to or coming from. Went through Rotherham Turn, then went up to Vienna, and then came back down again to um, Trieste. Just an interesting little little item there. Another rather than term item, this one showing an excellent ex example of how it fitted together. The uh, letters were opened and then resealed. And this is a, an example of the red resealing mark for rather than term. The cashier was applied to show that it had been treated and that it could pass onwards. Tracking routes can be quite difficult at times, but at least the, these are two post office notices that give, give the rates. I like the Butskani one, which is nine and a half pence. Well, the problem is the post office didn't have nine and a half pence, so they were making a nice little profit at that one. But it also mentions that letters via Trieste would be charging one and a penny, although there were very few letters did go via Trieste. And the other one is also 1857, and that is telling that the office at Georgia, which is on the Danube south of Bucharest, is now um, open and available for direct communications. Notice that it was signed by Roland Hill. Danube, probably most people are aware of the Danube Mail and the DDSG, which was the Danube Steam Navigation Company, and this was formed by two British shipbuilders and they um, this is just two examples one from Glatz to Baelia and the other one to turn a magnetary reel. The first railway to be built that did affect the post and speed it up was from Chernovoda over to Gunderstek which is Constanza today. Um, this is was built again by two British engineers and it did considerably speed up the mail that came in from Romania 
and also goods. It was primarily used for goods, but it then took it straight over to the Black Sea and saved about a, day, a day's sailing if it was going by the Danube. Um, that was opened in 1860. I've, got, I've only got one letter that was carried on it. Um, it's actually an 1881, but it does show that the mail was, the letters were still being carried on the, on the train. Courier mail, how these developed around St. Petersburg and connecting up with other places. And this was the Russian consular post. The Russians set up a lot of consular posts around the Levant. And um, here is one, here is an example. It's um, a, a long distance route, this one from Constantinople up, up to St. Petersburg, but included Romania, um, uh, Bucharest, Foscani, and uh, Yash. But there was also an eastern route. Uh, Odessa at this time was not in Romania, um, but uh, from Odessa to Galatz, Fiabalia, and to Craiova. So, um, but this is an example of the Russian consular post here. And um, this is in Galatz, which is Moldavia. And this is, it looks a bit like it was made with a John Bull printing set, but that's, uh, that's how they, they are. And of course it is written in Cyrillic. It, it is written in Cyrillic script. So not easy to read, but very difficult to find. I came across this letter from Odessa to Galatz. And the obvious route there, given that it's addressed to the DDSG in Galatz, and there was a DDSG office in Odessa, I thought, well, why didn't it just simply go by sea to Galatz? And this taxed me for a while until I found a reference in Dr. G. Mack's book on the Austrian-Hungarian Post of the United Principalities. It's an excellent book. The disadvantage is for me it's in German. He explains why, and that is that the, the mail at this time, after the, this is after the Crimean War, so the mail after the Crimean War all went to Bodhi in the Austrian post office. Austria was neutral, um, and uh, they were not directly involved in the Crimean War. They were neutral, and uh, this was a... A, a holding station for all the all the mail going into Europe and then they distributed it out and uh, it so it then came back through um, Chernovitz, Yash down to Galatz. One of the agencies that carried mail were Lloyd's and this is a, an example from uh, the Teologo brothers to Constantinople from the Teologo brothers in um, Galatz. So the Lloyds set up routes in the Adriatic and on the um, Danube and uh, on the Black Sea. Now we get on to Great Britain. Again, I have a lot of the mail here from the Teologo brothers. One of the brothers lived in Manchester. He was British, made himself a British citizen and he was very much involved in the life of Manchester um, and he also set up a, at a bank there and um, this is an example of that mail going from Manchester going the northern route via Krakow, Chernovitz down to Galatz so paid one of them so it would be a, a treble weight letter So I was mistaken on that. It was it was standard rate letter at that time. Letter rates were very high at that time. Um, 1853, another letter, this time again from Manchester, this time by Ostend and Vienna, and uh, went on, the, didn't have to go to Vienna because it went via the German railway, again through Chernovitz and Galatz. Another one, railway mail, showing a slightly different route. And uh, this is in 1854, which is at the time of the Crimean War. 
the, the Russians did move into the principalities in 53, and then the British sent a force out to the Dardanelles, and with the support of the Ottomans, they went up to the Danube, and eventually the uh, Russian forces uh, left. So uh, there was no fighting as such there. And the, in fact, the Austrians came in as a sort of peacekeeping force. Galatz by a vendor with a nice three and a half groschen hand stamp. It's the only reason I show this one because it's got this lovely strike of the three and a half groschen, which was an accountant's in mark that was issued to the post office in London. Um, but interesting item. And another Manchester Glatz, what we'd have done without the TLO Go Brothers, I don't know. This time via Trieste. I mentioned Trieste earlier as being an option, but um, it certainly didn't speed the mail up, but may have given them a different day in which they could have sent it. And so um, there may have been hope, but the journey time was 23 days, which was quite slow. Um, here's an item that is endorsed um, by Ostend and Pest, and then on the Danube by steamship. Um, note Vienna has been crossed out of the, um, the endorsement. So Vienna would, would normally have been one of the places that it would have automatically gone through, but in this case, it just simply went to Pest and went down the river. Um, one of the problems with sending mail by the steamships down the river was that in the winter time the Danube froze, and I can assure you, even in November, I've been in in Cluj up in the north, and it's been minus fifteen, and so um, it does it does get very cold in the area. So the post office, in fact, used to issue dates as to when they expected it to close the mail, and these were sort of November time. The river actually stayed open quite for long periods during the wet winter months in that they had freezing and thawing. thawing. So local traffic could still use the Danube um, to a certain extent, but it was the risk to shipping that was the big problem and the as to whether or not they could rely on it to be able to do it. So basically they said, no, we won't use it during the winter months. This one is another one, it's not endorsed that it went by the Danube, but it did go directly to Pest and then onto Glatz with no intermediate um, routing on it whatsoever. But whereas this one goes to, is a mail letter. That's probably why before the Danube reopened and you can see there it goes from Vienna to Basso and then on Palesti. So the Basso route is, would be overland. There you can see it there. 1870s, they, the mail um, to Constantinople itself went via Belgium, Vienna and the Danube, as it says here. Um, but again, they probably had the same problem because this is a December letter, which is clearly endorsed via Bucharest. So that would again have probably gone overland, but it was a close bag. So we can't, I, I can't identify it as such as going um, overland, but it does appear um, that it probably went, it was, it went by the France, um, Vienna, Belgrade route, it suggests here. European countries. Glatz, Glatz to Genoa. Um, interesting little item. Again, you'd think, well, Glatz on the Danube near the Black Sea could go all the way by ship quite easily. Um, but it didn't. It went via Genovitz, Craiova, Vienna, and then over to you know. So just very pleasant little item and uh, showing, showing the route nicely there. There's, there's a signature at the bottom there and um, 
it appears to be OM. You get these also on letters, which appear to be RH, I think it is, but it's followed by a number. And these appear to be batch numbers um, because there's a lot of research being done on these. Um, and uh, they seem to be sequential within the year. So early in the year, they're lower numbers. And by the end of the year, they're higher numbers. Um, and this is about halfway through, which is about right, because there seem to be about 100 batches um, going through. So that's, that's the assumption is that they are batches. If somebody knows differently, I'd be interested to hear from them. Mail from Corfu, I like this. Corfu, you know, nice, nice little island. Not an awful lot of correspondence you wouldn't have thought would collapse. And this one went up to Trieste and then overland, possibly to Belgrade. But it appears to have joined the Danube and gone the rest of the route to collapse. Um, a lot of mail from Greece tended to go directly through um, Constantinople and uh, either uh, up the Black Sea and on the Danube or across crossland. This is a letter that is vastled, well, not strictly vastled in this case. If you look carefully at the, there's some below the Galat's cache, the big oval cache there, you can see some vertical line and you carry on left, you can see the vertical lines along there. And these were um, cut in a device that's rather like a printing press with, with blades on it that come down and slice through the letter. And um, these, these were used in certain areas, certain of the um, disinfecting stations is an effective way of allowing the vapors to go in. I should that all this attempt to disinfect the mail using fumes and that was completely futile because cholera etc was not carried on on the mail. Um, it was carried by contact with other people. So um, so all this work is futile from a point of a medical point of view, but it does knock a stake in the ground for us postal historians to know which routes it was traveling on when sometimes there's not an awful lot of other information available. Another one with vascular marks, this time on a little registered item from um, uh, Bucharest to Pest, and this one goes by Hermannstadt, which almost certainly proves that it went by a Rotham turn um, and as a disinfectant station. And uh, the cross on it would normally indicate that it was prepaid. And the bottom there shows the how the charges were raised and nine pence would be for the registration and the total charge would be 21. Yash via Constantinople to Paris. Um, strange letter, this one. Originated in Malta, was sent to the French post office in Constantinople, was endorsed there um, via Austria or via the Austrian post and cancelled out um, to say via Cop uh, Constantinople. So it would have then almost certainly have gone back via Trieste and then on to Paris. Why it went on to Paris, I'm not sure because it went from Paris then to Krakow and uh, Yash. It may have gone that route. It may have gone that route simply because the it's prior to the um, Crimean War, the year before, but it's at the time when the Russians were rattling their sabers, sabers and starting to move into Romania. Romania probably realized there was a certain advantage in having the Russians put pressure on Turkey to prevent, to reduce the risk, well, to get the change that they wanted by which they could um, get their own country back as they saw it. 
Um, it did eventually happen when the, uh, the Russians moved in about 10 years later. Um, another letter this time, again from Galatz to, um, written in Galatz, should I say, it's written in Galatz. It's written by a, uh, a gentleman who was a recent graduate of Cambridge. He was also a Cambridge Blue and he had rowed in the boat race in 1838 on the winning side. So he was, uh, he was quite, a, quite a character. He was... Um, Warrington W. Smythe was his name, and he later was knighted. And his father was um, Admiral Smythe, and he was a founder of the Royal Geographical Society. Um, Warrington had a, an interest in the minerals um, in the Danubian areas and in Turkey. So he decided he'd sail down the Danube and see if he could explore the areas around the Danube, particularly um, up towards the Iron Gates to the, uh, to the sort of west of uh, Bucharest, where it's quite mountainous. And he discovered that it was not a good idea to take, make the journey in November because it was extremely cold and the natives were not necessarily hospitable. So he decided to stay on and he wrote this letter to Galatz back to his father explaining what the situation was. Um, but he didn't post it. He, he said in it he would post it in Galatz, but he didn't. And it appears then to have gone to Constantinople. And then somebody took it to Malta, where it entered the mail. So just a, an interesting route that um, happened to uh, coincide with his, his explorations. He did go on to do a lot of geological work in Turkey and he wrote the standard book at the time on the coal reserves in Turkey. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Gordon, we at the moment, basically, I've only got a couple of questions for you and they both come from Francisk Ambrose in particular. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, in particular, thank you. Um, in particular, he has a question for you about this letter, which I'm going to show you because I'll share my screen so I can quickly show the specific letter that you've got in your in your talk. This one, and his question actually is more of an explanation. You weren't sure where the disinfection slits were applied. Mm -hmm. I think the suggestion is that was at. Tomos, have I, have I pronounced that correctly? Ah, yes. So yes. That, that was the thought on that one. And yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Yes, that, that would make sense. And I believe they did use the vertical slits there. Yes. Thank you. And the other question that uh, Francis had was there was a letter, I think, that was written in uh, Braillia, was it? A Braillia? No, yes. 1841. Yes. The letter. Uh, who have a Bucharest cancellation, uh, but uh, our speaker told uh, was sent from Galați, probably forwarded. But in that time, and Galați and Ibraila, they have uh, the own cancellation, and the Austrian post offices uh, put the cancellation on the letters when they sent. So it's uh, probably not sent from Galați and Ibraila just was sent from Bucharest from, uh, by Austrian post office. Check ah. on the back side or inside of the letter if it's written, uh, the sender uh, written the letter in Galatia, how you say. Yeah. Yes, so, so you're suggesting that it was probably carried by somebody to, from Galatia uh, to, um, to Bucharest and posted yeah. there. Yep. We find uh, in time a uh, few letters, forwarded letters, by agents, private agents, but yes. uh, not from uh, the big cities, because all the big cities have their own uh, postal offices, Austrian postal offices, consular postal offices, and uh, they put the cancellation when the, the letter uh, was sent. And for this reason, I'm asking you uh, if the letter 1841, uh, you 
presented in the presentation with the cancellation Bucharest on the front. Mm -hmm. It's uh, sent from uh, Galatio Ibrahila. I forget uh, what do you say in, in that uh, time. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Gordon? Yes, yes, thank you for that. Right, and thank you for the question. Right, um, that actually was the only two questions that we've had, Mike. So I would like to hand back to you, I think. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you very much, uh, Gordon. I mean, obviously, you've um, bamboozled everybody with the uh, unusual um, and the uh, spectacular and they're frightened of asking you any questions on this very complicated subject. Um, anyway, um, it's obviously been a very, very uh, well researched and, and well presented presentation indeed. Um, I know how much work you've done on this um, and it, it's, it, it's very good the way it's come out in the end. So thank you for all the, um, the clear maps and the structure is good. We understood what you were doing. Um, we've been through the development of the mail routes, the courier mail, the mail to and from uh, Great Britain and the mail within Europe. You've clearly got some wonderful material. I mean, I'm personally not a uh, European collector, but I've learned a lot. And you, you come up with some very interesting examples of disinfection. Um, and that is one clear area that um, I have learned quite a bit myself. And I imagine a few other people have as well. So thank you very much indeed for all your work. And thank you for talking to everybody. Uh, you'll be pleased to know, I think, that you did almost get to 100 in terms of at its peak when you were talking. Thank you. So um, I'm not sure whether whether Peter um, is there and can hear uh, and whether he wants to uh, make his own contribution. If, if I can just hand over to our president and find out if that's the case. If I get nowhere, you can come back to me. I am here. Good. And um, miraculously, the electronics are holding together, at least for the next few minutes, I hope. Um, so good afternoon to everybody, and especially to Gordon Hardy good afternoon, for Pete. an absolutely wonderful um, uh, e e exposition. Um, the, I mean, I, I am incredibly ignorant about that part of the world. I've never been closer than, than a beach in Turkey. And... Um, uh, a, a, a dance hall in Halicarnos, which some of you may remember in your ill-spent youth. Um, but um, what I have managed to earn this afternoon is, is a lot about um, the Danube, about how mail was crossing around, and as Mike has said, a great deal about disinfectant and disinfecting arrangements. Um, with, with that, I discovered a new word for the next time I'm playing Scrabble. It's called a rastel. Um, I love that word. I have a note of it on my pad here. Um, and the next time we have any trouble from any of my grandchildren, I shall be getting out the rastel. But anyway, what I really want to do this afternoon, Gordon, is uh, for myself and on behalf of everybody at the Royal to thank you very, very much indeed for giving us this great presentation and to present you with a certificate which I'm hoping very much that Mark Bailey has got um, on his screen somewhere. Uh, and sadly, sadly, on this occasion, I don't, Peter. I don't have the, an electronic copy of it, but um, I'm sure that the printed, you know, the, the paper copy, oh, once well, I'm you sorry signed that, it, that, will, that. will find its way to Gordon, won't it? Yeah, you'll... It, it will indeed. I'm, I'm so sorry, Gordon, that, that that is an error somewhere, because I did sign it um, two or three days ago uh, in... in uh, in, the office. in original as you might say um and it will come to you as soon as possible i'm sorry we don't have it here today to present to you that, um, that's all right peter it's probably my fault in that i've been plaguing him uh, plaguing mark over the last few days and he's probably not had chance to do it well that's that's <laughs> quite all right but thank you very very much indeed uh here is your um not only digital but but magic um 
uh, certificate. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and a, a very good afternoon to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, just like to say, I, I forgot to say at the very end, just like huge thanks to Mark and, and Mike for um, helping me put this together, and also for Nicola at the library, um, at the Royal. Um, without that, I would not have been able to, the facilities at the Royal and Nicola's help has just been phenomenal. And without that, I would not have been able to put this together um, because it, it's, it's quite difficult when you're studying a country remotely. Um, so thank you very much anyway for, for coming along to hear my presentation. Mike, can yes. we just see whether we can uh, get, get an answer to one more question that just came Of course, came up. yes. Yep. Gordon, the question has come from Thomas Herpfner, who asks, are you able to talk about the letters from Switzerland to Gika and Sturza in Romania in the late 1860s? I'm not familiar with them. Um, I... I'm saying I'm not familiar with them. I, I think I probably have one, but I haven't done any research on it. So I can't add anything more to that story, I'm afraid. Maybe I can just say uh, something, uh, Gordon. Uh, that's yes. all right. Um, it's just that um, I have seen quite a number of these letters and um, they're franked uh, with stamps, of course. And I thought it's uh, a nice addition uh, to the color Yes. of um, this theme and um, I was wondering whether you uh, might be aware of some family relations between Romania and Switzerland uh, that was behind this correspondence. Uh, it, it is strange that there does seem to be quite a lot of, particularly later on, a lot of mail going between um, Switzerland and Romania. Did you say that one of those was its carny? one of the letters is that where it, where it was going to um i think uh, bacau is one oh, of the Bacau, destinations yes yes and uh, the originating uh, locations would be lausanne and I've Genève. Lausanne. yeah so uh, the southern uh, switzerland areas yeah and yes, that's the late 1860s and uh, going into the uh, early 1870s, 1871 yeah. and 1872. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, the railways started up in the 1870s. Um, 1869, 70 was the main um, period when Bucharest got law, uh, linked through to its carny up in. Um, the the north which is uh, in effect a border crossing there so i i seem to remember the item i have is is from that um one of the items that i have came in in that route from um and i i have a feeling again it, it was it was similar to the one you just said yeah. so but i'd have to dig it out and have a look yeah. at it and, and have a good good yeah. study of it yeah right. Great, With thanks. a presentation like this, you're quite limited as to how much you can show. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, the biggest problem I had was sorting through a um, hundred odd different items to find the 30 odd that I was going to put in this display. So, yeah. Thank you for the question, anyway. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Um, Francis reminds us, Gordon. For those people that are going to Notos in Athens next week, mm -hmm. that there is a very interesting exhibit with foreign post offices in in the Romanian territories ah. in the period in the period yes. eighteen eleven through eighteen seventy eight. Mm -hmm. So anybody that's going to Notos, there's a chance for you to see that uh, exhibit. Unfortunately, I'm not. So. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Mike. Back to you then. Okay, well, I think that uh, wraps it all up. Um, thank you once again, Gordon. Um, no doubt people, a few people will stay online to have a, have a chat, but uh, I think that f ends the formal proceedings. So thank you very much.